All right, I'm going to kick us off. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session on what will it take for EVs to benefit the grid. My name is Katie Fahrenbacher. I'm a senior writer covering transportation for Green Biz and co-chair of the Verge Electrify event. I'm extremely excited today to be speaking about this fascinating topic. Um, you know, in the ideal electric future, EVs will pl plug into the grid and use dynamic software to help make the grid more resilient and smart. The, but the reality is that, you know, the details of this, the vehicle to grid, vehicle grid integration um, are just only emerging. And the whole dream of um, uh, vehicle to grid technology is kind of a ways off. But, you know, folks are fascinating with these topics, um, looking at in the news, things like the, the grid blackouts with the California wildfires and the um, extreme weather in Texas. And so, you know, everyone's really wondering, you know, how can EVs benefit the grid? Can they make them more resilient? Can they provide backup power? You know, and we're going to dig into all these things. We're going to explore what it'll take to move from this vision to reality. So today we've got some great speakers. We've got Adam Langton. He's the energy services manager for BMW North America. We've got Miles Mueller, the attorney for the climate and clean energy program for NRDC. And Charles Post, manager of the energy storage strategy implementation, VGI and load management for PG&E. Each of our speakers is going to speak for just a couple minutes to tell them uh, about themselves and their program. Um, and then we're going to jump into the Q&A portion and I would love to hear your questions throughout. So when you have questions for folks, just put them in the chat channel. I'll check them out and I'll try to weave them into the conversation. All right, Adam, let's start with you. Kick us off sure. tell us a little bit about your program. Great, Thank, thanks Katie. And thanks to the Verge Electrify folks uh, for inviting me here. Uh, so my name is Adam Langton um, and I work for BMW. I'm based out of our Silicon Valley technology office in Mountain View, California. And my role at BMW is to develop energy products that are related to our electric vehicles. And one of the main things I work on is smart charging um, for our electric vehicles. BMW has a smart charging program called Charge Forward uh, that we've been working on for several years um, in Northern California. And we announced this past uh, spring that we were expanding the program and we would target enrolling 3,000 vehicles um, in the program over the next couple of years. So we're excited to be growing this and, and, and we've been doing a lot in the space over the past few years. What's unique about Charge Forward compared to some other charge, uh, smart charging programs is that we use the vehicle telematics system to communicate directly to the vehicle. So we can tell the vehicle when to charge, when not to charge, um, and the vehicle can be plugged in on the grid, um, whether it's at home, work, or another location, we can, we can manage the charge because we're talking directly to the vehicle. There's not a special hardware requirement. We can do this with any of our production vehicles. Uh, last year, uh, we released a report on the second phase of our project where we looked at some of the results and, and some of the uh, benefits of doing smart charging. I'll have a chance to talk more about these in a minute, but one of the key results was that we found you could reduce carbon emissions by over 30% by using smart charging compared to not using smart charging. Adam, Charles, let's hear from you next. Sure. Charlie Post, as Katie mentioned, manage a diverse group at PG&E covering a wide range of topics, starting with energy storage strategy implementation, which really has focused over the years of meeting California's energy storage requirements, the 1.325 gigawatts on the grid. So that's been a, a major effort. Also picked up a group, VGI, which is working on vehicle grid integration, working with Adam on the BMW Charge Forward pilot. And the space we're looking at there is really trying to figure out what vehicles can do for the grid. Can they be backup power? Can they use them for fire situations? Can they provide resilience? So really all the things that you mentioned, Katie, are use cases or applications that we're hoping to explore in the not too distant future. So with that, Thank I'll you. To Miles? Yeah, Miles. Okay. Thanks, Katie. Um, again, Miles Muller, I'm a climate and clean energy attorney at NRDC based in our San Francisco office. Um, and for a quick background, NRDC is a national um, nonprofit environmental organization uh, with more than 3 million members. I work on the uh, climate and clean energy team um, focused on policies and investments uh, to uh, accelerate the uh, electrification of the transportation sector, as well as the transition to a smarter, more affordable electric grid powered by renewable resources. Um, so I, I cover a lot of NRDC's engagement in uh, various EV utility 
infrastructure and rate design proceedings uh, and applications uh, throughout the West. Um, and we've been involved in uh, a number of those um, cases and proceedings um, on uh, infrastructure, VGI, et cetera, over the last 10 or so years. Thank you. So let's start off with a high level question. What is this big vision of how EVs can benefit the grid? So, you know, Adam, like what, what's the vision for the charge forward program? How, you know, how are all these things going to work together? Yeah, our, our vision is that you can use the flexibility um, in a person's um, uh, charging needs to benefit the grid. Um, and what I mean by that is you can, there's, there's enough time um, to shift someone's charging away from the times that charging is uh, detrimental to the grid or it's expensive or it's using a lot of um, not, you know, uh, fossil fuel generation to times that you can use more green power that are cheaper and that are ben uh, better for the grid. Um, the average person needs just a few hours uh, per day to charge their vehicle based on their driving needs, but they're, par they're parked a lot longer than that. So there's this inherent flexibility there that you can capture, but still allow somebody to meet all of their mobility needs. So that when they get to their vehicle, it can be full and ready to go, but we were able in the meantime to schedule that charging, to align that charging based on what the grid needs and also just the changing conditions on the grid so we can respond to that um, dynamically as well. In terms of clean energy, I know that was one of the findings from the Charge Forward program that, you know, clean energy can really be um, elevated um, through this kind of dynamic charging. Can you talk about that? Yeah, one of the things we were most curious to learn was um, how we can use electric vehicle charging flexibility to help support renewable adoption or to use more renewable um, energy in the vehicle. Uh, because it's so flexible, um, we can align that to the times when there's more renewable energy. Uh, and renewable energy is, is not particularly flexible. You get solar energy when it's sunny and you get wind power when it's windy. And you can't control the weather conditions um, that are responsible for that. But you can shift a lot of the electric vehicle charging to line up with those times. We worked with UC Berkeley to study this, to look at what our vehicles were doing, look at where the grid was heading and things like that. And what we found was that by using smart charging, you could get 1,200 kilowatt hours of additional renewable energy into your vehicle by aligning those times. Uh, the top charging times with renewable energy. And to be clear, what I'm, I'm really talking about here is just shifting the charging. We're not talking about discharging the battery yet at this point. We're really just talking about shifting the charging time and still allow people to finish all their trips um, and, and not have any of their mobility impacted by that. Yeah. Charles, from your perspective, you know, can something like that scale and really help PG&E manage the clean energy load more effectively? I think, it, you know, it's one of the tools in the toolkit, as they say, we have the big batteries we're working on to move big blocks of energy, the same thing you're charging at times of excess renewables and discharging at times of needed power. The same thing. I mean, bad EVs, you know, somewhat batteries on wheels, you know, as we believe it can do the same, it can shift, as Adam mentioned, on just the time of charging. And then what we're working to get to, oh, it sounds like people are having a hard time hearing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we can we can hear you. It's just soft. Okay, so let me. Um, you know what we're really trying to get to is more of a future where we can discharge. You know to use it at you know times we can have capacity shortfalls using it for backup. Really, you know, a whole use case is beyond just the managed charging. Yeah, Miles, is that something that you you've been looking at through NRDC, kind of this pairing of clean energy and EV charging? I think as both Adam and Charles mentioned, um, there's a really big um, opportunity for EVs to help uh, facilitate the integration of uh, renewable generation. I think that's a big benefit there. Um, and one thing I'll add is that um, I think the question for the panel is how can EVs benefit the grid? But I think it's important to note that um, EVs are already benefiting the grid um, to a large extent, um, helping to spread uh, the cost of maintaining the grid over larger volume of electricity sales. Um, and we've had, um, there have been a couple studies looking at that in California where um, I think the, the value to this point has already exceeded $800 million. So I think in addition to um, helping to integrate renewables, it's driving down the cost of maintaining the grid. Um, and there's a lot more that we can do in the future. So we're really just scratching the surface at the moment. Yeah. And the, the industry talks a lot about, you know, 
kind of a spectrum vehicle grid integration and then going to, you know, actually V V two G, you know, Adam was alluding to, um, that charge forward is kind of this um, early step before uh, actually having this two-way relationship with the grid. Um, Adam, why don't you talk a little bit about, you know, kind of what this spectrum is, like starting from kind of the very initial kind of um, connection to kind of a more sophisticated type of landscape? Yeah, I, I think there's a few different steps in the, in the process of vehicle grid integration. The most basic uh, element would be curtailing charging when you have um, you know, a supply issue, when you don't have enough supply. That's the easiest thing to do. You stop charging for a while and then you start it again. Um, and um, that's, a, that's a basic functionality that's what we started working with uh, when we first started this project with PG&E. Second phase we went to was doing optimizations where we'd actually optimize the charging against conditions on the grid. So starting and stopping it based on what was happening on the grid. Um, Beyond that, you start to get to things like um, taking a, a fleet of vehicles and getting a fleet of vehicles to hit a particular target. Um, so you're optimizing not just the individual vehicles, but you're optimizing a fleet. Um, and then beyond that, you start to get to V to G. And it feels like there's maybe two main flavors of, of um, bi-directional or, or uh, V to G. One is where you're discharging at your facility, but never discharging onto the grid. So you're just uh, offsetting your load, but you never run the meter backwards. And I think the third most, or the most advanced category of all this is when you're actually discharging the vehicle battery and it's discharging onto the grid. Um, I, would, I would categorize those as the kind of the flavors that we see in vehicle grid integration. Yeah, where does charge forward stand in that program and, and where will it go on, on that spectrum? Yeah, so right now we're doing optimizations. Um, so we're doing individual vehicle optimizations, working on um, taking on more and more factors and doing more complex things there. I could see it in the future um, moving toward a V2G um, scenario in the future. One of the things we announced with PG&E this spring was that we wanted to work together to explore how we could um, implement V2G. What were some of the challenges? What were the opportunities? What was the value um, from a research perspective? So that is uh, at this point, it's still in the research stages of understanding what those opportunities are so we can understand what the requirements are in a vehicle and wonder, understand what the requirements are for the grid. Yeah. Charles, um, if we could hear a little bit more about that kind of V to G vision from PG&E's perspective, we'd love to hear that. Yeah, it's, I think, very similar to what Adam discussed. You know, we're starting with this. Oh, sorry, there's a dog in the background. We're starting with this you know, the managed charging, the optimization, and then doing research on what the use cases are that really make sense mm -hmm. there. You know, there's a whole bevy of opportunities out there and it's really deciding which ones make sense, which ones customers are willing to have, you know, a certain level of you know, change in behavior for, and then, you know, are there market products that can compensate for? So it really is, it's, you know, our next phase, we'll be working with Adam on the charge forward. We have as part of the CPUC VGI decision, we'll be proposing another I guess, fleet of pilots sometime in July that really, you know, will attempt to move us forward on that spectrum, you know, starting with more of the, the V to H, you know, moving V to H for backup, moving into V to H for, you know, load shift, potentially export, doing the same thing on the commercial side, and then looking ultimately as our, I guess, our end state pilot of the really V to G participating in Kaiso markets, trying to realize you know, additional values that can once again, flip around and offset the cost of EVs for consumers, which hopefully will drive more consumers, which will provide more products. Sort of that loop, that cycle is what we're hoping to get into. Yeah, thank you. And a question on the chat channel from Ryan. Um, is, is there any research on battery lifespan with V to G? Is that something that any of you are tracking that, that um, you know, V to G is, can significantly affect kind of battery lifespan? Well, I can go ahead and take that one first. Um, I think the question that we're asking ourselves is when you're doing V to G, um, how often are you cycling the battery? Um, and what is the expectation for a utility or for a customer? And that's gonna be able, once we understand that, we can understand what the impact on the battery life is. Um, discharging the battery itself is something that the battery does as it's driving as part of its regular mobility needs. But I think what we're trying to understand is how often are you discharging it? Because that's gonna determine that impact. I don't think we have a good sense yet of what that um, 
what what to expect um, from a typical vehicle, how many times it discharges in a month, for example, just to the grid. I think that's our, our big question. We can answer the question of what's the impact on the battery life. That makes sense. Anyone else have any thoughts on that one? No, I think the only thing I'll add is, and once again, what it's being used for, if it's being used, you know, more predictable using big blocks of energy or moving blocks of energy. So more like you would drive a car where it's charging and discharging versus if it's providing a CAISO service like regulation where it's more you know, rapid up and down, it can have more of an impact on the battery. But those, those are things that we'll be learning. Yeah, I have a question. I mean, just as a, from a journalist perspective, been looking, following the V to G space for a while and always seems like it's, you know, always so far away, it's like the next big thing, but then, you know, uh, it's always in a kind of a pilot or a trial phase. Um, so kind of what's what's holding this back? Um, what are the biggest barriers to kind of that full V to G vision, Miles? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, one thing that we've really um, been uh, advocating for the past couple of years, like you said, VGI is always one of those things that's, you know, two to five years off. Um, uh, we've really been trying to uh, push to make it more than just a, a theoretical proposition. Um, so I think uh, over the past year and a half, maybe a um, year or so, we've seen a, a number of tangible differences where I think VGI really is moving from, um, V2G is moving from theory to reality. So we got um, a number of decisions coming out of California and New York is looking at its own process. Um, there's uh, the recent announcement from Ford on what they're doing, which is more um, B2B, but I think uh, we're seeing a number of clear differences now with the uh, maturation of VGI and V2G, um, where it seems different than where we were a couple of years ago. And the one thing I'll add is, um, as more and more states look to do this, uh, one thing that would be, um, one thing that we've been advocating for is to really avoid um, over pilotization of this. So there have been a number of working groups going back, I think, almost eight years now. Um, and I, I think it's really, um, we really need to avoid having our own individual uh, new pilot process or new working groups that each take a couple of years. Um, so I, I think we're seeing a number of, um, we're seeing a lot of progress recently and we really need to um, seize on that. Yeah, I um, was excited watching the Ford F-150 Lightning um, launched them talking about how the uh, product can provide backup power for three days. That was super interesting. What did you guys think? I mean, Adam, from your perspective, were, were you impressed? I, uh, excited, skeptical, thoughts on that? Um, well, I think it's always exciting uh, to see the VGI world and the v, V2G world move forward. So I think that these are um, exciting times for the technology. Um, I do think, um, you know, one of the barriers is making sure that the vehicle is ready. We also have to make sure that the grid is ready to handle that as well. Um, you know, to be able to um, handle a, a device discharging on the customer side um, and that we know how we handle islanding of that home, um, how we handle, you know, if there, what if there's a, um, what if the power is uh, de-energized in a particular neighborhood? How do you make sure that in that neighborhood that vehicle doesn't start discharging and discharge to the grid then? So I think there's some like safety issues and just coordination between the utility and um, the, the V2G vehicle that would need to be sorted out. Um, but I think uh, as we see more and more of the technology move along, I think it's, it gives us more um, of uh, it, it, more of a push to start addressing those questions that I think are gonna be really critical to making this roll out on at scale. Yeah. Charles, what does need to happen for the grid to be able to invite uh, a, a bunch of F-150s um, providing backup power? Hey, it's a challenge. I mean, first off, on the excitement level, I think when people saw the announcement and we saw the announcement, it is, you know, it's a very heavy truck, so just a massive battery, which is very exciting from, you know, a potential perspective. There's a lot of stuff that needs to happen. You know, there are certain parts of the grid that it's easy. You know, there's available capacity, there's available hosting capacity, and there are no constraints there. You still have the safety issues, like Adam mentioned, of you have to make sure the power is not flowing places that you don't want it to flow. So it is, you know, the proper islanding mechanisms. There are metering questions. How do you measure the energy in and out in and out of the vehicle? You know, always rates questions of at what rate should they be charged? 
so we do, especially with our new leadership, the new theme has been, you know, to imagine what would it take? So it's really thinking, what would it take from a regulatory, from an operational, from a safety, from a grid? And that's something that we've really kicked off fully also over the past just even couple of weeks is starting to iron out what would it take in each of those areas? And it's, it's a lot, but it is, I think the grid is forcing us to change. I mean, we aren't, things can't continue as they've worked in the past. You know, customers want more of a, I'll say a dynamic system where they can participate more, they can do other things. So, so we're going to have to figure out these, what will it takes to get it done? Yeah, yeah I, I think I'd add one other thing um, that related to one of the comments we saw here um, about cu the customer impact. Um, I think one other thing is we need to make sure that customers who choose to participate in this can have you know, the peace of mind that they're going to be able to meet their, their mobility needs, their mobility requirements. They're not going to wake up one morning and find out that their battery was completely discharged because the grid needed some power there and now they can't go to work or something. So um, I think one particularly important and, and interesting role that automakers can play is we can um, engage the customer and what, um, uh, what the opportunity is to participate and make sure that their mobility needs are kind of protected. That's one thing we focus a lot on in Charge Forward is making sure that the customer is always comfortable with what we're doing in their vehicle um, in terms of meeting their next travel requirements. And so we always gave the, one of the things we do in our programs, we give the customer the ability to opt out of any smart charging event and their vehicle will start charging immediately and, and can get full. Um, so I think, uh, I think we need to learn more about that, what customers, um, how they need to bound that and how their mobility needs fit in with what we do on V2G. I think that's a bit, an area that has not been explored yet. Yeah, that's a um, great point about uh, customer experience, um, which I, I think that um, the industry is probably going to need to invest a lot more in, in user design and customer experience and things like that. What are some early lessons learned so far just in these pilot programs um, that you know would be helpful in terms of engaging customers? But uh, Charles, oh, go ahead, Adam. Yeah. Oh, um, I I'll go on, Adam. Okay, sorry, sir. I kind of interrupted you there. Uh, but in, in terms of early lessons, I mentioned before we released a report last July on our experience um, in the past couple of years doing research on this. I think what we discovered is that um, there's a lot of flexibility that drivers have in in their um, charging, um, you know, requirements and their in their plugging in behavior and things like that. Um, you can motivate people to plug in during the day, which is really important to absorbing solar energy. Um, that's a, an important opportunity that we can take advantage of. Um, messaging to customers can be effective, but we, in terms of explaining to them what we're doing, like if you do, if you give us more flexibility, we can help support the grid with getting more renewables, or you can use more renewable energy in your charging. That's important. But um, we found that incentives were the key motivator for a customer to participate. Uh, even if they were small incentives, they add up over time and customers are, are definitely aware of that. And I think the last thing I'd, I'd say um, would be, we did encounter some challenges with the way the current um, demand response programs are structured. Um, and, uh, you know, to get more vehicles to participate, we probably need to look at some of those, um, the rules and the requirements for demand response. I know that pg &E has already started looking at this. They had a workshop exploring these issues in, in March. So um, there's activity going on in that space. And, and I think we identified a few, a, a few specific areas that uh, would allow more vehicles to participate if we, if we change some of the program rules. Charles, did you have a, another thought on that? Yeah, not a whole lot to add other than just, you know, I think the early lessons are customers are interested. You know, they are looking at ways, A, to save money and B, you know, generally have the good intention of trying to help you know, green California. So it is, it's just, as Adam mentioned, it's figuring out ways that they can participate, whether it's is demand response or is, you know, aggregated into a, the Kaiso market. It's just earning out the details of how they can do it. Yeah. And we've talked a lot about consumers and, and this whole spectrum of vehicle to grid, um, but fleets are um, obviously a, a big potential business and, and benefit, um, particularly with uh, school buses and, and electric school buses and, different types of um, use cases for fleets. Um, you know, what have, what have you seen, um, maybe I'll throw that one to Miles, um, have you been tracking kind of uh, how, you know, fleets and companies have been able to 
um, lead some of these charges in certain areas, like with electric school buses? Um, and what are your findings there? Yeah, I think there are a number of like critical um, different use cases that bigger vehicles can provide. Um, so, for example, backing up critical infrastructure. Um, there have been a number of pilots um, looking at that in California. I believe there's also uh, maybe one on the East Coast, but I know San Diego Gas and Electric kicked off their school bus V2G pilot um, sometime, I believe, last year um, looking at doing this. I think that's um, currently pretty early stages. I don't think there's much data coming out of it yet. Um, but I know that a number of utilities are really looking at how to use um, those larger batteries on wheels uh, to provide a number of those different services. Thanks, yeah, Miles. I would agree. It's an exciting area. You know, it is. There haven't been as many pilots as Miles mentioned. There have been some. I think it's another area that the utilities are looking to explore because it is, you know, as far as easiest, you have, you know, bigger assets that are easier to control that are more predictable in their behavior. You know, a school bus is is going to be you know it has a very set schedule so you know when it's there and when it's not there and when it'll be available and what will be an inconvenience or not so i think the potential is large for the fleet side yeah and california has really been kind of leading the way in trying to figure some out some of these issues out um what are some early lessons learned from um the california process um you know the cec has been kind of going through this vehicle grid integration process recently um you know are there things that's happened in california that we can kind of use in in other scenarios yeah i can start it um and then you know Miles and adam i'm sure will have some thoughts i mean it, you know the one issue in california is the over piloting as miles mentioned you know, we have to get beyond the pilot phase and that's different folks we'll talk to and this is true on the storage side as well of you know Technologies may be ready to take off. There just has to be a real program, a real opportunity for them to do it. So I think a lesson learned is don't get stuck in pilots forever. You know, figure out how you can move from pilots to you know, at least early commercial. You know, the same other lessons, like you said, customers are interested, companies are interested. You know, there's a lot of innovation out there trying to figure out how this whole thing can work. So it's you know, hopefully the lessons will start coming faster as we as we move out to commercial. Yeah, and just to add to that, I'll, I'll note that one thing that um, I think was useful in the California process um, to perhaps uh, um, kickstart some of the um, getting out of like the um, you know the pilot process and the, the working groups is there was a bill that was passed in 2019, um, SB 676, that directed um, the utilities to really look at how to facilitate um, and enable VGI strategies by 2030, and I think that played a big part in kind of. Um, uh, kickstarting some of that progress and uh, getting it out of just the, the working group and pilot phases. Yeah, along those lines, I, uh, another example of that that I think helped move things forward, um, CPUC in December um, uh, came out with a decision that let the utilities um, start to grow VGI programs. And I think that was also really helpful in um, moving the space forward. Um, CPUC, you know, put out a statement, you know, essentially said, like, let's start scaling these things um, and, and identifying what's ready to go. Um, and it also took a more open perspective instead of saying, like, let's figure out exactly what communication standards or, or what um, elements we're going to use for this saying, hey, let's go out there and actually start scaling it and trying different things. I, I think that's was a big step forward. Yeah. Um, a reminder to the audience, um, if you got questions, put them in the chat channel. We'd love to hear from you. Um, from a regulatory and a policy perspective, what would you need to make this industry move forward? How can, are there regulatory things that can help um, push past this kind of death by pilot situation that Charles, you were alluding to? What do you guys need? And Miles, do you want to go first? Yeah, I think there's a number of things that um, policies from states and commissions can do um, to really create that market for um, markets or pathways for payment for the services that vehicles can provide. Um, and one thing I think that's important is to make sure that um, you know EVs as batteries on wheels uh, can compete with other resources in the real world that are providing the same services. So, for example, letting um, managed charging or V1G count as storage. Um, there have been uh, there was a study from uh, LBNL, I believe, that looked at uh, the value of doing that in California, um, saving ratepayers 
around $1.5 billion compared to using stationary storage. Um, so I think it's really just a market enabling thing, um, getting um, new policies out there that allow VGI, um, that allow vehicles to offer those services and to actually um, be paid for them, um, the things that they are already technically able to do. It was an excellent summary. <laughs> I, guess, I guess the one thing I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, no, no. Charlie. Did you, Adam? Uh, I guess I, I agree with everything Miles said. Um, I think those are excellent examples of what we can do. I think the other challenge is um, generally, uh, a general challenge is that we're dealing with a behind the meter device. And how do we get that behind the meter device to participate? Um, can be a challenge if you have, for example, if you have other devices, in some cases, you can't have two devices um, behind the same meter participate in different programs. Um, and that makes it hard then if, you, if your air conditioner is participating in a program and you want your vehicle to participate in a program and they're different, how do you, you know, we don't have good rules that allow for that yet. This is a fairly new thing. So I think it's, um, you know, something we need to wrestle with more. Um, and then just the other challenge with the behind the meter um, device is that if you're relying on the meter to do all the measurement for that, you're picking up all this noise of other devices. Can we use other performance measurement um, uh, opportunities, such as the vehicle itself is doing a lot of measurement? Um, could we use that to, to validate performance? Those things I think are things we need to continue exploring. And I think that makes it much easier for customers to participate if we have those opportunities. Are there things that, you know, an automaker uh, would benefit from to maybe enable this uh, more quickly enable, um, you know, uh, bi-directional charging, um, you know, for in terms of warranties and things like that. So what what would a company like BM, BMW need? Yeah, that's a good question. I think one thing that would be helpful is uh, I mentioned this before. Could we uh, have a, a sense of how many times it's going to discharge? Um, and at what rate it's going to discharge. Um, and uh, that would help us figure out the impact on the battery. It also then is something we can use to communicate with customers because part of this is gonna be getting customers comfortable with this. And that, that may fall, that may, the responsibility for that may fall on the automaker. Um, and if it does, we need to understand what's gonna happen with the customer's vehicle so that we can communicate that to them and they can always be comfortable participating. I think some of those things are, are still unknown. I think we'd also want to know um, that we're not creating a safety issue. Um, you know, that the uh, that we have a, a clear way of understanding what's happening on the grid in their neighborhood or, or their town so that we know that there's not going to be a safety issue. And I think some of those things we haven't, um, we haven't you know, haven't gotten into the details yet of, but I think those, those would really help us um, participate. And I, and I guess the other one would be, what is the value of this? What's the value proposition for a customer that has this vehicle? Because in some cases, you can imagine that B2G ends up being an option on a vehicle. So if it's an option on a vehicle, the, you're going to need to, it, it, there's going to be an extra cost to it potentially, and then there's going to be an extra value to the customer. Well, the customer is not going to do that unless they understand that value. So being able to um, articulate that to the customer makes a big difference to getting the adoption we want. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of questions on the chat channel about demand charges for, for Charles. Um, you know, is, is there a way about uh, how does uh, vehicle grid integration and, and even B to G do these, how do they intersect with kind of the whole idea of demand charges for public fleets and, and, and companies that are trying to, um, you know, charge their vehicles when they want. Yeah. Now you've gone to an area that, is not within my wheelhouse, as they say. I don't know, Miles, if you have thoughts on demand charge, you know that you can obviously use them to minimize your demand charges by shifting your, your charging behavior, but as far as the demand charges themselves, I don't know, Miles, thoughts? Yeah, I'll start by noting that um, now all of the uh, three large uh, investor owned utilities in California do have reformed commercial EV rates that uh, should improve the economics of um, public fast charging, uh, charging for medium and heavy duty fleets, et cetera. Um, so I think that goes a long way, but in addition, um, it's really important to, um, on top of those rates, to enable folks to have advanced load management technologies that help them manage their load. Um, so I think there's been a lot of progress on that over the past couple of years. Uh, I think that is going to play a critical role, especially um, as utilities are looking to now uh, establish more dynamic rates. So really, um, certain types of fleets um, might be more capable of responding to those dynamic rates. Uh, and that advanced load management technology is going to be critical um, for those use cases. 
Thank you. A question from Kermit on the chat channel. How much of the EV charger technology that's already been deployed and installed has bi-directional functionality? Like, will we need to go out and retrofit a bunch of chargers if we want to do this? Um, Adam, that's probably a good, good one for you. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think very little of the existing infrastructure can, can handle uh, bi-directional power flow. Um, it, it needs to have both have the hardware capability, but also some of the communication capability needs to be there as well. And I don't think there's very much um, that can accommodate BMW vehicles. Now, there are other types of vehicles that use other charging standards, like uh, the Chatamo standard uh, from Japan. I don't know much about that, so I can't comment on that. Um, but the other element that we, it, it's not just the charging station itself. We also need to make sure that the utility can handle if it's being discharged. So the utility needs to say, yeah, the infrastructure in that neighborhood can handle this. Um, and so we need to make sure of that. And that's another layer that we'd have to have to explore. Yeah, yeah. I mean, go ahead, Charles. No, no, it does. And, that, and I think there was another question in the chat, as you know, how does how is discharge from a vehicle different than discharge from a PV system on a roof? Right. And part of that is just the way it's studied when it's installed. You know, when I added solar to my house, they look at the grid to see if it's able to absorb the incremental generation. That's not done with vehicles because vehicles right now are just poles. So it really is just looking at the grid a different way of, you know, is there capacity to allow this new generation to flow onto the grid when it was not contemplated to begin with? Yeah. And it sounds like, you know, one of the big hurdles is it's just a kind of huge uh, issue with um, uh, data and parsing data. So, you know, kind of figuring out what what is going on in each side of the vehicle and, and having things talk to each other, a data and communications issue. Um, you know, Adam, how do we solve that type of issue? Um, are you seeing kind of innovation around the kind of data software space that would be helpful for that? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple um, aspects to that. One is uh, we're we're looking as somebody who's managing smart charging and our charge forward program. We're always looking to get more data that tells us about what's happening on the grid. There's opportunities to get renewable um, energy data. We're using that. Um, one interesting opportunity would be could we get more data on what's happening on the local grid in the neighborhood that we're in, so that we could help manage um, the constraint in that local neighborhood. Um, and that's something that we're, we're definitely interested in, in, in doing more on. Um, and we've done so, we did some use cases, um, I believe in 2019, with PG&E where we started testing out uh, the functionality to accommodate that. Um, so that helps us um, as well. Um, and then, um, you know, more uh, in a V2G space, you need a much richer data set about what, where the grid is um, energized, where it's de-energized, what times, things like that. Um, but for now, I think it's, it's it, we would love to get um, a more, more constraint information so that we can provide more information to the grid. That's really the limitation. We have the functionality to start and stop the charging and control it and move it, engage the customer um, and make sure they understand what's happening. Um, what we'd like is just more and more information that we can use to manage that. What about Miles or Charles from your perspective? Um, is, uh... Is data a huge barrier and and uh, and do you see promise of uh, kind of new innovation around around data management algorithms AI things like that helping kind of move this process along more quickly uh, I, I can let Charles speak to more of the utility perspective but I know that that's been a focus of uh, the California Commission's work over the last year or so with um, their VGI decision recently and within their transportation electrification framework. So trying to make that, uh, that data problem a little bit more uh, manageable and digestible, um, trying to actually give folks the data that they need um, to, to figure out how to do those things. Yeah, I think data and you know, visibility from our side on what, what these resources are doing at a particular time, what they're capable of doing. So just the data flow from and to the utility is, is huge. Yeah. We only have a few minutes left. Um, I want to encourage the attendees to take the survey that's pinned in the chat channel. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, and a uh, question about equity. You know, it's been, um, 
you know, equity and making sure all communities are um, included in these types of new technologies is, is something that we've talked about a lot today at Virgil Electrify. And, you know, this whole movement with uh, vehicle grid in integration and, and B to G, um, how do you make sure that these um, technologies are deployed in a way that um, all communities can benefit from, um, from this technology? Hey, Miles, I'll extend that one to you. Yeah, I think uh, at a high level, it's important to note that um, low-income households typically spend twice as much on gasoline as they do on electricity. So just getting more and more folks into EVs, allowing them to realize fuel cost savings from switching, uh, goes a long way in reducing their monthly household expenditures. Um, and the, the equity piece has been a focus um, in the California Commission's recent efforts. So in that VGI decision that Adam mentioned, um, they included um, specific call-outs saying that the utilities um, uh, program should look to prioritize disadvantaged communities um, and uh, look at providing elevated incentives for those folks um, to uh, really enable them to reap the benefits of EGI, as well as enhanced uh, education and outreach to make sure that they uh, understand and are aware of those benefits. Yeah, as Miles mentioned, that as we develop our proposed pilots for the VGI decision or the proposed programs for the VGI, a big component of it is the DAC, you know, making sure that it's not, you know, it's not giving money to, you know, those who least need it, but to give it to those who need it, so that it is a core principle. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I guess I would um, echo those statements as, um, as well. I mean, we've we've already heard some examples that Miles shared earlier. One example is, you know, just as more EV charging happens, you get. Uh, to spread some of the base costs of operating the infrastructure, the electric grid infrastructure across a larger number of kilowatt hours, and that helps reduce electricity cost um, for everyone. Um, so that can help low-income households as well. Uh, I think uh, uh, V2G school buses is another good example. Another one that's uh, worth uh, noting is um, air quality benefits in certain corridors um, from electric vehicles can really benefit um, low-income communities. And what we can do is think about ways to target those benefits even more. Um, so, um, you know, trying to get more benefits in those areas uh, through different ways of targeting it, um, I think would be really, really helpful. Yeah, there's um, a lot of uh, you know, entrepreneurs and uh, tech uh, software providers um, attending Verge Electrify today. What would be kind of your bit of advice, um, particularly from Charles and Adam, about you know how they can work uh, with a large company like yours, the utility and automaker, um, and uh, you know what what bit of advice? How how can they work with you, with both of you? I'll go ahead and go first. We we work with a number of startups in our our program. Um, and uh, it's a great opportunity for us to see what new technology is available. And it's also a, um, a great opportunity for them to understand, you know, what an automaker is thinking in this space. So we're always looking for opportunities. We're always looking to, uh, to talk to more startups. I think uh, what's important is to think about the role that you play relative to an automaker. Um, and, um, you know, I talked to a number of companies about fitting the, together those roles. Um, so that you, uh, you know, you can leverage the things that we do well already. We're we're going to continue doing those. But if there's new opportunities, new data um, sources, new analytical features, and things like that, um, we're definitely interested in exploring that. So I think figuring out how what you do fits in to what an automaker does in the space is the real critical element um, to focus on. Yeah, and similarly, you know, we're always open to hear what's out there. You know, we discussed a little bit the. The lack of bad directional chargers at this point, you know, to the extent there's new technology that people have or developing, we're always interested to meet with them to hear, you know, how it could or could not work with us. You know, the exchange of information, what's important to us, you know, the safety, the telematics, the whatever it is, you know, to help them as they as they develop their products. So we did this a lot on the storage side. We did it a lot on the renewable side before storage. We're just a lot of working with developers to talk about what they could do and how we could help. Yeah. And a final question for the three of you, you know, what are you most excited about um, for this vehicle to vehicle grid integration world um, in 2021? What's uh, what's kind of what's making you excited, getting you jazzed about about this space for this year? I'll go first. I think it is um, 
you know, with the Ford announcements, with other announcements that are coming, you know, it is the automotive world is really jumping into this, you know, as an early adopter of an EV, there were not, there were not a lot of options. You know, now the number is growing rapidly. And I think the same, the number that are growing that can be used for more, whether it's grid services or backup or whatever it may be, will be growing quickly as well. So that's my optimistic look. Yeah, I, I can go next. I think uh, uh, building off of that, yeah, I think the Ford announcement really just bringing um, V to B, V to G to the mainstream is really exciting. Plus, all the new programs that we have out there, getting some of that implementation data uh, to inform future policies and future programs, I think that's going to provide so much value compared to um, what's been happening over the past couple of years, which is mostly just you know uh, reports and working groups and white papers. And I think um, we really just need much more of the the real world data. Um, we don't need any more, I think, white papers at this point. I agree with that. Uh, yeah. and, and from my perspective, I think the thing I'm most excited about this year is the opportunity to do more um, smart charging um, with renewable energy alignment. Um, what we've seen this year is a, a kind of a renewed push toward addressing climate change, a new energy behind it. Um, we've seen many states come out with new renewable energy targets. Um, over the past six months or so. And what I'm excited about is, um, yeah, as we're seeing that change on the grid, we can have electric vehicles really help enable the grid to handle that. And I think we're gonna see more and more examples of that, that I um, point to how electric vehicles and um, renewable adoption can go hand in hand to help one another. All right, thank you so much, Adam. And thank you to all of our speakers, Miles and Charles today. We really appreciate your thoughts. Um, it was a great conversation and thank you to all the attendees. We loved your questions, appreciate your engagement. Um, we're gonna continue the conversation. Um, we've got some great net networking uh, functions happening and we've got a conversation on um, equity in the EV rollout in about 30 minutes. So come back and join us um, and thank you so much for your time today. Thanks. Thank you.